few announcements for you as we get going today. I want to really extend a very warm welcome to Pastor Larry Westfield. Pastor Larry is here, here, and he's going to be our preacher for the day. Please stand up, Larry, and let us see you and greet you. Welcome him to the round of applause. <laughs> Pastor Larry is the regional gift planner for the ELCA Foundation. And he is going to be our guest preacher today, and he comes to bring us some challenging words about, first of all, some gracious words of generosity and how we can share the gifts among us. And he challenges us a little bit today, today too, to think about how we can share our own gifts, and thank you for bringing that word today. Um, he will be around today after worship, going to eat with us too? Excellent. He's going to have... Left side. Left side, yes. So you cannot miss that. He will be around during our mealtime as well, and I encourage you to connect with him this morning as well. We're going to begin our time of worship today with our opening prayer, time of reflection. I'm going to ask you to stand as we prepare to share that together. As we pray together, Pete will lead us into our next song. Let's pray. Creator God, we seek be transparent in this hour of worship. We confess to you that in the clash of kingdoms, yours and ours, we too often choose the immediate security, the least threat, and the most pleasurable. We are too easily trapped in the world of our own making. Help us, we pray, to remind ourselves that all belongs to you. Give us courage to trust in your steadfast love, long-suffering mercy, and grace. Listen to you.
Kyle to come forward. He's going to share our Matthew text, our gospel text for this day. Thank you, Kyle. Today's scripture is found in Matthew. After Jesus begins teaching in the temple, religious leaders try to trap him with questions. First, they ask if God's people should pay taxes to an earthly tyrant like Caesar. Matthew writes, Then the Pharisees went and plotted to entrap Jesus in what he said. So they sent their disciples to him, along with Herodians, saying, Teacher, we know that you are sincere and teach the way of God in accordance with truth and show deference to no one, for you do not regard people with partiality. Tell us, then, what do you think? Is it lawful to pay taxes to the emperor or not? But Jesus, aware of their malice, said, Why are you putting me to the test, you hypocrites? Show me the coin used for the tax. And they brought him a denarius. Then he said to them, Who had, Whose head is this, and whose title? They answered, The emperor's. Then he said to them, Give therefore to the emperor the things that are the emperor's, and to the God the things that are God's. When they heard this, they were amazed, and they left him and went away. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Good morning. Good morning. It's a delight to be with you today and to share a few words about uh, today's text and a few words about the work that I do and to also offer to each one of you a challenge. Render to Caesar the things that are Caesar's. Render to God the things that are God's. When they pulled the coin from their pocket at Jesus' instruction and looked at the image on the coin, whose image did they see? Caesar. Caesar. And it also says that along with the image of Caesar on that coin, there was also a title. And that title would have read, Son of God. Because they believed that Caesar was indeed not only their monarch, but also their spiritual leader. So for the Jews to actually carry this denarius in their pocket was to be in possession of a graven image, the very thing that was rejected in the first two commandments. So Jesus inviting them to give to Caesar what belonged to Caesar was not only inviting them to pay the tax, he was also encouraging them to liberate themselves, to be free of the burden that came along with carrying a graven image in their pocket. And then he said, as a follow-up, give to God what belongs to God. Now I ask you, what belongs to God? Everything. Caesar. The coin. Everything belonged to God. That must have been quite a moment for those people who were in Jesus' company that day and heard Jesus refer to this gift, returning to Caesar what belonged to him, liberating themselves, and then returning to God what belongs to God. Since 2005, it's been my privilege to serve as a regional gift planner for the Evangelical Lutheran Church in America Foundation. Most people don't know that we have a private foundation available to each one of us. So for those that feel the need to go out and establish a private foundation to manage their wealth, you don't have to. You already have one. You have a private foundation called the ELCA Foundation. It is our tool in our church for processing any gifts that we need help to process so that we can be a blessing to West Beacon Perry Church or to ministries of our church or even charities beyond the ELCA. The ELCA Foundation is there to be of help to you. We are a church constantly being renewed, being reformed into the image of God. And a part of what it means to be God's church, what it means for us to be constantly renewed, 
is that we also are a church finding new ways to be of service. New ways to live out our call as God's people in service to our neighbor, in service to people we don't even know across this globe. So today, I thank you for all of the efforts and work to sustain and grow the mission work of our congregation. And we're going to go and eat downstairs in a few minutes. And in our eating, be reminded of how our women of the church are involved in supporting missions here and beyond. So I hope you can be part of that. I intend to be. I hear there's left some. I didn't hear anything about Ludovic. Kind of happy about that. After serving nine years down in the valley, just a little ways from here, Chaseburg, those of you that know that area, I served nine years. That was my first call and enjoyed it very much. And I understand the dogs still bark in Norwegian down there in that valley. <laughs> from there, I went to be at St. Olaf's Lutheran Church. So I went from one Norwegian community to another Norwegian community. And the big event at St. Olaf's was the first Wednesday then, now it's the first Saturday of Advent, was always the big Lutefisk dinner. That was a great moment. Of course, I like Lutefisk, so that was just fine with me. But there was a time when there were two uh, farmers, I think, who came to the Lutefisk dinner, and they were standing in the entryway of the church, and they were having a little fun getting back and forth. At least I think they were getting and one said to the other, have you ever eaten lutefisk? And the other one says, no, I can't say that I ever ate lutefisk, but I do think I stepped in it once. <laughs> I'll be downstairs for a little bit of left side. <laughs> now my call is to serve as a regional gift planner. I serve in six cities. So I serve in all of Wisconsin and Upper Michigan. My work is to help congregations think about how they can best be stewards of the special gifts that come to them. And this very mock root gift which you received is one of those very special gifts. North Coon Prairie Church, I just received an email to inform me that they also have received one of these very special gifts. Along with very special gifts come very special responsibilities and opportunities to be good stewards of those gifts so that that memory of those saints can continue to inspire the ministry we do together as part of the church. To make sure that we continue to be a church made new and of service to those people that we may not even know all around the globe. I'm excited because we are doing that as a church, not only your local congregation, West Newfoundland Prairie, but something we're doing as a whole church. In August, we sent 63 young adults in global missions all over the world, and for the first time, we have a missionary presence through our young adult and global missions in the country of Rwanda following the genocide just uh, 20 years ago in that country. That's something for us to be very proud of as a church. The sad part of that story, though, is that we had 155 applicants from young adults to be involved in global missions. We had funding to be able to send out 63. So what that meant was we said, we don't have the funding for you to be a young adult in global missions. And we said that to 92 young people of our church. So we are given great opportunities, but there are even grander opportunities. So I ask you today, are you able to envision greater ministry if money were not a limiting factor? If you can envision greater ministry than what you now experience, if money were not the limiting factor, then we are able to realize what we are able to do together as people of God if only we pool what God has blessed us with during life 
but also beyond our lifetime so that we are able to do God's work. You established a mission endowment fund here in this congregation. What you did in establishing that fund was to create a container into which those special gifts can be received and where they can be managed in a responsible way and where they can be distributed in the most intelligent and beneficial way for enhancing ministry here in your community and in the world as Paul has just informed us. And then empowering the leaders of this congregation to envision how some of that may be used in even more creative ways to accomplish God's purposes. And you, friends, can be part of that. It's not difficult, and it's not about money. When I took the call from the ELCA Foundation to serve as a regional gift planner in Wisconsin, there were many of my pastor friends who accused me of giving up the sign of the cross for the sign of the dollar sign. I want you to know I still make the sign of the cross, and that's how we live as servants under the cross, because it's not about money. God does not need your money, but God's work does need our money. And we can do that while we're alive. Paul baited me at the first service so that I'd have to say a few words about giving while you're living. And my, my belief is always do your giving while you're living. And you know one who you're blessing. But not always will we be able to do that. Because we never know what it is that we might need someday. And so I also invite you to pray and consider putting something into your plans for the benefit of others and your congregation beyond your lifetime. As you're able, do your given while you're living. But also think about how you can be a blessing to others when you are no longer here. Leroy is one of those individuals who decided to do his given while he was living. And so he came to me and he told me when I was pastor at St. Olaf's, I would like to give to my church $100,000. The amount doesn't matter. But why I mention the amount is because that was a large, large gift for him. He was a farmer. And uh, he had uh, spent the last few years of his life not farming, but simply doing other things. So I knew this was a major stretch for him. And he made the decision he was going to do it. I wasn't sure how his family felt about it. But I helped him, and he accomplished the gift. It was some time after he had made the gift that he passed away, cancer. And after he had passed away some time, maybe year two, more likely, I happened to encounter his son at the grocery store. And his son, Tom, said to me, Pastor Larry, I'd like to talk to you. And I thought, oh boy. And then he said, can you come over to my house? And so I called and made arrangements and I went over. He was outside tending to some gardening. And he simply showed me around and I thought it was stall tactics. And then finally he invited me in and he held the door. And as he was holding the door and I was entering, he said, I suppose you know why I wanted to talk to you today. And I said, well, I suppose it has something to do with the gift that your father gave. And he says, yes, you're right. Come on in and sit down. And I was just bracing myself. I was ready, you know, for whatever was coming, and I expected it. And he started off by saying, I want you to know how proud I am and how proud our family is that Dad was able to do that and that he got it done while he was alive. We couldn't be happier. He could have knocked me over with a feather. 
I wasn't expecting that. But what he taught me is that it is a celebration in the family when there are these kinds of gifts that we're able to give. It is a celebration because we realize that in the waters of baptism, we are baptized into a family where we live not just for ourselves. We are baptized into a community where we live for others. And we pray that God might continually make us new so that we can be of service to those people of our family, but beyond, to be of service to people wherever they may be, whatever their need in this vast world. That's our calling as the baptized people of God. But not always are we able to, like Leroy, make that gift while we are alive. For many of us, the biggest gifts of our whole lifetime will come when God calls us to our eternal reward. <clears throat> then we leave it all behind. And what I would like to ask you to pray and consider today is that you include something for your church and for ministries of the church. And I can assure you that your family will be excited and happy about your decision to think of others. When my wife and I were making our decision about how we would benefit others and how we would make the distribution of our estate, we made a life decision. My wife and I decided that we would treat our church and ministries of the church and charities that we wanted to support as if that were a member of our family. Now we have two daughters. We're proud of both of them. They both have families of their own, and I'm not hesitant to say that they married up. They're better off than their mother and father. They're going to be fine. We want to be generous to them, but we know they don't need it all. And so we've made a decision that we would include our church and charities of the church and charities we care about as if that were one of our daughters. So when our girls were home and seated at the kitchen table with us, I started the conversation and I said, girls, this house has been so big since you left. And your mother and I have been quite lonely in this big house and so we're telling you today that we have made a life decision and the life decision that we have made is that in our old age we have decided to adopt another daughter <laughs> yeah yeah you guessed it up to that point they had only been suspicious that mom and dad had lost it <laughs> We just confirmed it. <laughs> Mom, not to miss a beat, jumped right in and said, yes, that's right, girls. We're excited to tell you that you have a sister. <laughs> oh, joy. <laughs> and your sister's name is Charity. Uh -huh. And then they began to catch on what Mom and Dad were up to. And I have to say, that I know my two natural born daughters and their families are going to be just fine. I carry a bigger concern for our newly adopted daughter. Frankly, I think she's gonna need the most help as we go forward in time. We told our daughters that day at the kitchen table of our decision for three reasons. First of all, we wanted them to know our values. We wanted them to understand that in our baptism, we're baptized into a family where we think not only of ourselves and those closest to us, but we also think of others. We wanted them to re be remind reminded of the fact that mom and dad heard that scripture, render to God the things that are God's. 
You see, it's far more important, folks, for us to pass on our values than it is for us to pass on our valuables. And we all need to think about how it is that we establish things in such a way that we can pass on those values that have come from those who have been faithful before us. So we told them because we want them to know our values and remember those values beyond our lifetime. We told them secondly because when mom and I mature to glory, we hope that's a long time off in the future, but when that day comes, we don't want our plan to come as a surprise to them. I've seen too many families blow up when there is a surprise an unexpected surprise that the children may not like entirely or find objectionable. So when you are able, make sure that you have the family meeting. Sit down with those that you love and explain your plans. Bring out the balance sheet. Don't hide things. Let them know. They'll thank you for it, I can assure you. And for those of you that would like a little booklet, I've got a booklet, it's called Important Notes About My Estate. It's where you can record things for those who have to know those things when you're not here. I actually prefer to call it Before I Go, You Should Know. If you would find one of those helpful, just mention it to me and get, give me your address and I'll make sure that one gets mailed to you. We need to do this. It's a part of our responsibility as a Christian family. But there's a third reason that we told our children, and that is that we knew there would be a day, we hope some time off beyond our lifetime, when they will sit down with their children, and they will have a discussion about how it will be that they be good stewards of all that God had made them responsible for during their lifetime. And we know that may be far and far beyond what their parents ever had to manage with any luck, with any good fortune. We know that'll be true. And when they sit down to have that family conversation and mom and dad have matured to glory, maybe then they'll remember our values. Maybe then they'll think about their sister, Charity. And maybe they'll make the decision to render unto Caesar what belongs to Caesar, but remember to render unto God what belongs to God. And then just maybe, just maybe, we will be fortunate enough to have charity not only as a daughter, but as a grandchild.
we like to sing. It's called Spirit of Deceits for Us. This is a song that was first of all verses that we'll sing about four times in between. There'll be some prayer intercessions. Let's stand as we pray this together.
gather today as Christians have been gathering throughout years, generations, eons, cultures, gathering to receive the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ. Pastor Larry preached the word, we had songs, we had prayer, and now we gather around this moment of the table. And we remember that in the night when she was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread, gave thanks, and broke it, gave it to his disciples. He said, take and eat, this is my body given for you. Do this for remembrance of me. And then again, after supper, he took the cup, gave thanks, gave it for all to drink, saying, this cup is a new covenant in my blood shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sin. Do this for the remembrance of me. So gathered into one by the Holy Spirit, we pray as Jesus has taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, forever and ever.
Peace of the Lord be with you all. Take some time. Greet one another with that peace as we go this day. Peace is time.